Good morning, Emmanuel. We're so glad that you could be here this morning. Would you stand and worship with us? This morning, we're going to ask you to greet one another, but, but hear me out. We got a week till Christmas, and if you haven't gotten sick already this season, we don't want to start now. So wave to your neighbor, greet one another, take a moment to greet one another. There you go.
Merry Christmas. We're, we're the Kim family. We wish that today's Advent reading will bring you peace and encouragement. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he'll be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Peace. This time of year, it seems like we see and hear the word everywhere. Go to Home Goods, TJ Maxx, or Target, and you can find the word peace on pillows, paper plates, coffee mugs, wrapping paper, wooden sign, t shirts, you name it. Busy parents just try to find a quiet moment to wrap gifts, decorate their homes, or prepare for holiday. Yes, simply long for some peace and quiet, while their kids are just getting more and more wound up as Christmas morning approaches. During this fourth week of Advent, we're focusing on the name Isaiah gives to Jesus, Prince of Peace. This Prince of Peace shows up in the Christmas story not only to bring temporary comfort during a frenzied season and external circumstances, but he also invites us to experience a settled, permanent peace deep inside of us as we learn to trust him and receive his gift of salvation. Jesus is our peace. He doesn't just give us peace, he is our peace. Before his death on the cross, we were enemies of God, at war with him because we were living in sin. But his crucifixion provided the only way for us to be reconciled with God winning the war so that we could be at peace with God and be called his children and his friends. Jesus brings peace. One of the greatest benefits of being in a relationship with Jesus is enjoying the peace that he brings during our trials and in our relationships as we are controlled more and more by the Holy Spirit. Isaiah confidently promises us that anyone whose thoughts are focused on God and who trusts him will be kept in perfect peace. Jesus will be our peace. One day, all things that rob us of peace will be no more. During Advent, we will not only celebrate Jesus' coming to earth for the first time, but we will look forward to the day he will come again. On that day, Satan will be conquered, and the rule of Christ and his peace will never end.
celebrate your coming to earth. God, we just want to worship you. We just want to gather together and sing songs and praise your name because you are the best gift that we have ever received. So, Father, as, as we travel to connect or if we stay at home, God, wherever we are, I pray that you encounter us this Christmas season that you reach us wherever we are. Because no matter how we spend our Christmas, God, it's better with you. It's better with you. We love you and we thank you for all that you're doing. Amen. Good morning, Emmanuel. Welcome to church today. We are so glad that you have joined us. The first thing we want you to do is we want you to sign in. Go to the Church Center app, to the check-in tab, sign in, let us know you're here. If you've never heard of this incredible app that we have, you should download the Church Center app. It's great. It helps you get information on things that are happening here at Emmanuel. It helps you to sign up for different events. So go ahead, download the Church Center app, and if you have it, you should check in right now. We want to celebrate a couple things that happened right here last Sunday. The first thing is during second service, we welcomed in eight new members of Emmanuel Church. So we are so glad to have eight new members of our family here at Emmanuel. We were just happy to be able to welcome them in and bring them into the family. So that was awesome. And then also last week, we had a cookie stroll, which was a fundraiser for our teens going to Nazarene Youth Conference. And we raised almost $2,000 to cook 
cookies flew off the shelf so fast that if you were here for second service, you might have missed them. Last week was a great week, a lot to celebrate, and we just want to thank you, Emmanuel, for being a part of all of it. And as soon as we get into 2023, the first Sunday that we're here, we have something big. This is a family event for our next-gen families, which means if you have a kid, six weeks up to 12th grade, you can be a part of this event. It is Family Nerf and Nachos Day. It's going to be right after church on January 8th, and it is how it sounds. We're going to enjoy some nachos, enjoy some Nerf. We're just going to have a great day together with a lot of fun. If you're interested in showing up, sign up. Go back to that Church Center app. Go to the More tab, to the Sign Ups tab, and sign up to be a part of a day full of fun and full of nachos. But if you need any more information about everything that I'm saying, you should pick up a bulletin. We have them at the doors if you want to pick one up to get more information. If you're joining us online, you can also get a bulletin there. On our website, lansdale.church, there's a bulletin right on the homepage. You can Click on it, get more information on everything that we're talking about, including our schedule here at Emmanuel for the next couple weeks. First off, this Wednesday, December 21st at 7 p.m. is our longest night service. Maybe the holiday season isn't the easiest. If you're grieving this holiday season, if you are at a loss this holiday season, if this isn't an easy time for you, we would encourage you to come to our longest night service. It is a service that is centered around that, around loss, around grieving. So if that is you during this holiday season, we want to encourage you and support you at that service. So again, this Wednesday at 7 p.m., there will be no child care. There will also be no live stream. It is an in-person service right here this Wednesday. Now, after that comes Christmas Eve. Christmas Eve is Saturday, December 24th. Did you know? that Christmas Eve was Saturday, December 24th? I hope you did. But did you know that we will have two services that day? Two services that day, both of them online, and we will have them in person as well. So four o'clock and six o'clock are the services for Christmas Eve. So we would love you to be here. We would love you to be online. We would just love you to be a part of what we're doing here on Christmas Eve. Now, if you plan on showing up in person, you're going to get here a little early because we might have some treats, some refreshments for you out in front. Child care is offered Christmas Eve during both services, ages birth up to five. And it's also offered the next day, Sunday morning here at Emmanuel because Christmas is on a Sunday this year. Isn't that crazy? It hurts my brain a little bit thinking about how that's going to work and how I'm going to eat all the Christmas cookies in all these different places. I don't know. I'll have to figure it out. But all you need to figure out is 10 a.m. Christmas morning. You can be here. You can be online, at home, in your jammies, whatever you want to do. And you can be here in person enjoying with us. And we'll have child care just up to age five. Uh, everybody else will be in service together enjoying that Sunday morning. And then we have New Year's Day, which is also on a Sunday morning, which also hurts my brain, but that's not difficult to do. It happens a lot. January 1st is an online-only service. We will not be in person that day, just online. So then you can definitely stay home in your pajamas with your hot chocolate uh, and hang out. You can wake up after seeing the ball drop on Christmas Eve, wake up that morning and watch a service that will drop some truth. You see what I did there? That's pretty good, right? I tried. If I missed anything, if you missed anything, just grab a bulletin or check it out online. It has all the information you need. And that way, even if I mess up, you can just grab a bulletin. Just a reminder, if you would like to give today, there are many ways to do so. Uh, you can give in person. We have receptacles in the back and also one in the lobby to drop off physical donations. If you would like to give online, lanzel.church slash give is the place you want to go. Or... Head on back to that amazing Church Center app and go to the gift tab. You can give there as well. All our options if you would like to give during this holiday season. Well, Emmanuel, we are glad that you are here today. I'm glad that you are here today. I'm so glad that you're here. And I'm not going to take up any more of your time. Let's go to service together. For unto us a child is born, unto us... A son is given, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and today, Prince of Peace. Of all the commands that Jesus ever gave us, and there were many commands, I think Matthew chapter 6, verse 34 is the hardest. 
Do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow has its own worries. You know what Jesus is saying, right? Worries of sin. Well, that's not good news because I got a problem with that, right? I mean, think about it. Jesus is saying to you and me, don't worry about how your kids will grow up and turn out. Don't worry about your job. Don't worry whether you're going to have a happy marriage or not. Don't worry if you'll ever get married. Don't worry about your relationships. Don't worry about your health. Don't worry. That feels impossible. Now, Jesus is not saying don't be concerned about those things, but the difference between concern and worry is worry has a way of bleeding over into everything and sucking joy out of you. Jesus says, learn to rope your worries back into a place of genuine care and concern, but let me be the one who worries about the things going on in your life. I suppose it's probably fair to ask the question, what is worry? Did you know that worry in the Bible, the Greek word for worry is actually the word for anxiety? We are living in an anxious age which is the same as saying we're living in an age of worry. Author Seth Godin described anxiety this way. It is experiencing failure in advance. You okay there, Joyce? When you're anxious, you are experiencing all the feelings of something bad that has not yet happened. And yet 85% of what we worry about, sociologists and psychologists say, never will happen. So 85% of what you're worrying about at this moment is actually never going to happen. And of the 15%, hey, look at me, come on. Of the 15% that actually does happen, four out of five people say, well, we just dealt with it at the time and we took it as a learning experience and we got better for it. So, I think it's fair to say, what is peace? What if you could overcome chronic anxiety and live in peace? As impossible as that may sound at this moment, because Jesus never commands us to do something that's impossible without him helping us to do it. So, what is peace? The Greek word for peace, you know it, it's the Hebrew word from the Old Testament, shalom. You ever had anybody come up to you and say, shalom? Shalom is deeper than just being happy. Shalom actually describes a sense of wholeness, of unity, of well-being, of without interconflict, that cognitive dissonance, without that. You're at peace with yourself, you're at peace with God, and you're at peace as far as it's up to you with every other person. So the great question this morning is, how is Jesus your Prince of Peace? Let me give you three ways. The first is, Jesus is our Prince of Peace because Jesus restores our broken relationship with the Father. Romans chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, since we have been made right in God's sight by faith, we have been made right in God's sight by faith, that's righteousness, we now have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ our Lord has done for us. Have you ever asked yourself this question? Why is sin such a big deal? Why does God take sin so seriously? What's wrong with a little bit of cheating on your taxes? What's wrong with skewing the truth to make you look a little bit better? What's wrong with a little bit of innocent flirting at work? 
What's wrong with a little bit of porn? What's wrong with those things? Why does God take sin so seriously? Here's the reason. Sin always destroys relationships. Ask anybody who has ever gone through a separation or a divorce, whether it's a child or the spouse. Ask anybody. The devastating consequences of a divorce. The same thing happened to Adam and Eve. Because they willfully chose to do something they knew was wrong, what ended up happening is it fractured their relationship between them and God. And they needed to leave the Garden of Eden. The same thing happens to us. You know that feeling on the inside when you do something that you know is wrong? There's a relationship fracture between you and God. You don't feel as close to God as what you used to. You feel like there's a barrier now. Jesus came to break that barrier to restore a broken relationship back with you and God so that you can be in peace. We call that the peace of God. Number two, Jesus teaches you how to live peacefully in your everyday life. John 14, 26 and 27. But when the Father sends the advocate as my representative, that is the Holy Spirit, he will teach you everything and will remind you of everything that I said to you. I am leaving you with a gift, peace of mind and heart. And the peace that I give is a gift that the world cannot give. So don't be troubled or afraid. There are two things you need to see about this teaching from Jesus about the Holy Spirit. The first is this. If you know Jesus, you have the Holy Spirit already inside of you. You do. You have the Holy Spirit already living inside of you. And the purpose of the Holy Spirit is to teach you everything and to remind you of the words of Jesus. Now stop and think about that. The purpose of the Holy Spirit is to teach you everything. What does that mean? Everything. That's what it means. Jesus will teach you how to manage your money so that you won't be anxious because you'll have financial margin. Jesus will teach you through the Holy Spirit. Jesus will teach you how to manage your time and prioritize your time so you won't always be running around crazy, active, busy and not have time for your kids or things that really matter to you. Jesus will teach you how to be a great employer or an employee so that you can run or be part of a successful business. Jesus will teach you how to have friends and be a friend so that you'll never be lonely again. Jesus will teach you how to get along in your marriage. Jesus will teach you how to be a great parent or child. Jesus teaches you how to respond to authority appropriately. Now listen to this. Why does the Holy Spirit teach you all those things? Do you see the next verse? John 14, 26. Because Jesus wants to give you a gift. And the gift is peace. The Holy Spirit wants to remind you of everything that Jesus said, and he wants to teach you everything because Jesus ultimately wants to have you live in peace. It is not God's will for your life that you are living in constant anxiety. Yes, we are human, and yes, there are times in which life does get the best of us, and we go underwater for a little while, and we go, oh my goodness, I feel like I have the weight of the world on me. But guess what? Through the teaching of the Holy Spirit, we bounce back up, and we get above water again, and we say, okay, we can do this. I've been through a rough season. It's been two, three, four weeks, or months but ultimately jesus wants the core of your life to be free of chronic anxiety or worry the result of the holy spirit teaching you everything is first corinthians 14 33 god is not a god of disorder but of peace that means jesus wants you to live a well-ordered well-balanced life of calmness and productivity. Now, how does the Holy Spirit do that? The Holy Spirit does it primarily through three ways. First of all, through his word. I talked about this a little bit last week. I gave you three scriptures, and I promise you that if you read these three scriptures, you memorized these three scriptures, you saturated yourself in these three scriptures, man, worry would just kind of dissipate away from you. 
because you're getting the mind of Christ. You know, if you're struggling with anything today, you ought to go and do a Google search on whatever that topic is. You know, sometimes I'll look up all the Bible verses that have to do with anxiety, and I'll print them out, and I'll stick them right in front of me. And whenever I feel myself getting anxious on the inside, I'll just go back to those Bible verses. Oh, yeah, here's one here, here's one here, here's one here. God's Word is a great medication for the anxiety of your soul. Also, prayer, talking with God about your problems, is very therapeutic. Also, the church. Being with other Jesus followers in church, in small groups, doing life together, is wonderfully therapeutic. You know, there's constant studies that keep coming out. I just saw a new one recently. People that go to church live longer and they're happier. You want to live longer? You want to be happier? Start going to church. Start showing up every Sunday. Except for January 1st. All of these things work together to bring peace. I said a couple of weeks ago that Holly and I were gifted tickets to go to a symphony down at the Kimmel Center. And we got there about an, I don't know, probably 45 minutes to an hour early. And we, we went into the um, place where the concert was going to be. And we sat there and listened to all the instruments warming up. And it was chaotic. Oboes are playing. Timpani drums. Violins. And it was chaotic. Guess what? The maestro walks out on stage. He stands in front. Everybody gets quiet. He holds up his baton. All eyes are looking on him. All he does is this. Boom! It starts, and it's beautiful. You know what the Holy Spirit does? Jesus, the Prince of Peace, through the work of the Holy Spirit, teaches you how to play notes, when to play notes. And listen to this. It doesn't necessarily happen immediately, but through the years, as you begin to practice what Jesus tells us to do, your life becomes a symphony and it moves from fourth grade concert band. You know what I'm talking about, right? <laughs> I think that was Mary Had a Little Lamb. Don't you think that? I, I, I heard, I heard, I sort of heard a melody. You go from fourth grade band to a professional symphony orchestra. It's called the work of sanctification. And that's what God wants to do in your life. You don't have to be perfect if you're a new babe in Christ. None of us are perfect, and we've been following the Lord for decades. But you get more together as time goes by. Because Jesus promises you that he will teach you in everyday life how to have peace. Number three, Jesus has promised his presence in every storm we experience. Mark chapter 4, verses 39, tell the story of Jesus and the disciples being in a boat, and there was a storm on the Sea of Galilee. To this day, on the Sea of Galilee, terrifying storms can come up with little or no notice because it's in the great rift valley that goes all the way from Israel all the way down into Africa. It was the superhighway of the ancient world. For those of you who have been to Kenya, Kenya's Kids, which is a ministry out of our church, we had a children's home for many years in the Great Rift Valley that goes all the way to Jerusalem from East Africa. And so as a result of that Great Rift Valley, what happens is storms just kind of tunnel their way through and they can come up. You can be on the Sea of Galilee at 2 o'clock in the afternoon and it's sunny and bright. Hey, it's a wonderful day. By 3.30, there could be total clouds everywhere and a wicked storm comes up. And it's one of those storms came up while the disciples and Jesus were crossing over from one side of the Sea of Galilee to another and this storm was so terrifying that the disciples thought that they were going to drown. Jesus is laying in the hull of the boat. He's sleeping. The disciples get a little ticked off. And Peter, because he's always the loud one of the group, 
Peter runs over and he goes to Jesus, hey, you may not have noticed here, but there's a storm. Jesus gets up, speaks to the wind and the waves and says, be still, be silent. You know the Greek word for that is? Hold your peace. That's what it means. Whoo, stop. Some people think that peace is the absence of conflict, the absence of storms, the absence of problems and challenges. Some of you are just waiting for you to have peace in your life because you want all your problems to go away. That is not biblical peace. Jesus has promised us that he will give us his presence, his peace, in the midst of all of these challenges. Don't wait for your life to come together because it's not going to. You can have peace in the middle of it. So how do you get that kind of peace? We get back to Isaiah, chapter 26, verse 3. You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on him. Remember when Isaiah wrote his book, it was a time of social upheaval in Israel. It was a time of political chaos. It was false news. It was religious hypocrisy. All kinds of crazy stuff was going on. And yet he said, you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on him. The Hebrew word stayed on means to lean on and to rest in. Why was Jesus sleeping in the hull of the boat in the middle of the storm? Because he was perfectly resting in his relationship with the Heavenly Father. You know why Jesus, you know, sometimes Jesus rebuked the disciples, and you have to feel sorry for the disciples because you're like, man, they're just being human. You know what I mean? Jesus, why are you so hard sometimes on the disciples? Jesus mildly rebukes the disciples here in the boat. And he says, why, why are you doing this? You know why he said that? Listen, Jesus is saying to them, we were always going to be fine because I'm in the boat with you. And I'm the one that told you to cross over from one side of the lake to the other. Jesus has promised to never leave you nor forsake you. It does not mean the absence of tragedy. It does not mean the absence of challenges. It does not mean that bad things will not happen to you. But in the middle of all of those things, Jesus promises to be your Prince of Peace. A flight hit some unusual turbulence, tossing the airplane side by side in strong gusts of wind. An eerie silence settled over the passengers in between the sudden outbursts of screams. No one felt safe on the plane. Bolsters would drop, things would fall out. Everybody was terrified, except one child who sat there preoccupied with a notebook and crayons, drawing a picture of himself climbing a tree on a sunny day. A passenger nearby noticed that the boy seemed unusually calm and was just unrattled and drawing in his coloring book. And so she said to the boy, son, aren't you afraid? He looked up from his paper for a moment and then smiled and said, nope, I'm not. The lady said, well, well, why aren't you afraid? And he said, because my dad's the pilot. <laughs> and then went back to his drawing. Life sometimes feels out of control. Have you come to the realization that actually there's not a whole lot you can control? Control is oftentimes an illusion. We think we have something that we actually don't possess.
you do not have to live in chronic or perpetual anxiety because you have inside of you a wonderful counselor, a mighty God who fights for you and alongside of you, an everlasting Father who has promised to provide and protect you. And listen to this. Have you ever asked yourself the question of those four names of Jesus, wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace? You ever ask yourself the question why Prince of Peace is last? It's not because it's least important. It's because it's all-encompassing. If you know Jesus as your beautiful, wonderful counselor, if you understand that he's your mighty God that fights for you and with you, if you understand that you have an everlasting Father who will always protect and provide for you, who will never leave you, if you know all that, you'll have peace. Would you stand, please? Each week of Advent, I've been giving two invitations. The first is, if the timing is right in your own life, if you feel that tug in your heart to give your life over to Jesus Christ, maybe that portion of the message that when I talked about sin, you know that sin is separating you from God. You just may want to step out into the aisle. That's all I'm going to ask you to do. Just step out in the aisle and say, I would like to begin a relationship with Jesus Christ. And ask Jesus into your heart. Ask Jesus to forgive you of your sins. The second invitation is, every week, I've just invited you to come to these altars. I don't know if you have any religious background and you know what altars are, but altars are safe places. They're, they're Old Testament sanctuary cities where people run to when they're in trouble. So if you're lacking peace and you are experiencing anxiety today for whatever reason, the altars are a good place to come and to just say, I'm here. And I want to talk to you about these things. And so as the worship team comes, closes out with the last song, that's my invitation. If you want to receive Christ into your life, then go ahead and stand out in the aisle. If you want to come to these altars and just say, I've got to talk to the Lord about this, it's a really good time to do that. Let's bow our heads together. Holy Spirit, would you move in our midst right now? Would you speak to every heart? Would you help us to be honest with ourselves about our relationship with you? And our relationships with other people? Speak, Lord. We're listening. Invite us to healing today, would you please? In Jesus' name, amen.
morning, and we hope to see you Wednesday. We have the longest night service, and then Christmas Eve service, and Christmas Day. So we've seen a lot of each other. We love you, and just thanks for being here.